is Peter Walsh with m and Scott Ritter with the Decorated Apparel Expo. This is Ben Landisman with Lost in Screen and Digital Products. This is Deborah Sexton. And you're listening to the Two Regular Guys Podcast. 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 Hosted by Terry Combs and Aaron Montgomery. All right, welcome to the show. It is Friday, October 23rd, 2020. I'm Terry Combs, and you can find me at terrycombs.com. And I'm Aaron Montgomery, and you can find me over at oursuccessgroup.com. Uh, Terry, today we're going to be talking with a good friend of ours, industry veteran Scott Ritter, who we heard in the intro there with the Decorated Apparel Expo. Um, you know, Scott is uh, a wealth of knowledge. He's gone from decorator to software developer to trade show owner, manager, and has spent his career in this decorated apparel industry, Terry. So uh, we're just, yeah, I want to hear, you know, what, how things used to be, what, what things excite him that are new and, and uh, you know, everything in between. So I'm, I, I'm looking forward to this. I was there in the used to be, so I, I'll be fact checking him. Okay. Jeremy, all right. But... Good. Yes. I'll go. <laughs> when Scott says something, I'll go, Terry, is that correct? <laughs> Did that really happen in, uh, in 1983? <laughs> <laughs> I was still in, uh, let's see, middle school, probably about that time. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, we've got some, uh, some of our regulators checking in here. Christine, good morning from rainy Northern Michigan. Look on the positive side. At least it's not snow. So, uh, yeah, we've had some, this is always the time where we hit the weather report, right, Terry? But, uh, <laughs> and yours is nine inches of sunshine still. Kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no end in sight. Yeah. We, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that time of year here in St. Louis where the weather just can't quite figure out what it wants to do. So we were like, uh, in the, had a, had a freeze and, and in the 40s and, and 50s. And then yesterday I walked outside in the morning and I'm like, oh my God, it's hot and sticky. <laughs> it was 85 yesterday. And then today, uh, this morning, it was like in the uh, upper 60s in the 70s. And now uh, a cold front's rolling in and it's going to be in the 40s by the end of the afternoon <laughs> here. So uh, wow. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, everybody, when you get sick nowadays, it's the worst thing because everybody's like, do you have Corona? It's like, no, I'm just, I have, I have a cold. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with, with allergy season, you know, here in Arizona, it's like you're, you're in the grocery store and you're, you're holding that sneeze until you get to your car <laughs> because <laughs> you don't want to be pointed out, you know, yeah. which, <laughs> yeah, exactly. which there you go. I like that. That's good. That's good. All right. So we've got some other regulars checking out Eric in the comments as usual. Thank you, Eric, for being here. Uh, Wade, good morning. And Jerry and Jewel and Todd. Uh, Todd, hope you're feeling better. And uh, we got uh, Sandy checking in. Thank you for being here, Sandy. And Todd says he's still not wearing socks. So that's that's the weather gauge, uh, according to Todd. He, <laughs> if he's he's put pants and a hoodie on, but uh, when socks go on, that's uh, it's cold. <laughs> it is in fact winter. <laughs> uh, all it's, right. Uh, it's only going to be 97 here today, so we're we're below 100. So it's a, uh, a balmy 97, right? Is that <laughs> indeed <laughs> unbelievable? Uh, I, I don't miss that part of uh, living in Arizona, Terry. I'll tell you that much for sure. I, I had to turn the pool heater on because you know it's getting down in the 60s <laughs> and 70s at night. <laughs> well, I told you, I told you the story about uh, when I lived in Arizona, I had a pool and we'd have friends over for a summertime pool party. And the requirement for entry was bringing a block of ice so we could throw it in the pool to cool off the pool. <laughs> Who knew that was a, a paid service that you could have? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, all right. Well, we've got more regulators checking in. We've got uh, Marsha from Action Engineering checking in. Another great day in the ATL. Um, so excellent. And Dave, good friend Dave. How you doing, Dave? It's been a little while. Hopefully things are going good for you. I know it's not been a while for you, Terry, because you guys work together, I believe. That's right. Dave sent me a message that he needs me to call after the show. So. Oh, okay. All right. So he's here to make sure that when the show's over, you do actually call. 
Exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. <laughs> and Charles and Marianne. All right. Good. Uh, hot and humid here. So she's down in the Texas area. So we, we got all the, the bases covered, Terry. So let's hit a, a quick news item. Um, I've got uh, something that uh, I came across in my email and uh, Screen Printing Magazine's Rising Star Awards will honor six young people whose accomplishment in specialty printings have made an indelible impression. The award is open to individuals under the age of 35 who are employed in specialty printing businesses. Third party nominations will be accepted through the 10th of November. And uh, we will have the link in the show notes and uh, probably in the comments here shortly. Yep, there it is right there. If you want to put that up on screen, Eric, you can just hit that that bit.ly link right there and and uh, get over there and, and nominate 35 and under. So uh, we Right, right outside of our. <laughs> yeah. So anybody that's 36 to 40, you can still win our up and coming, come, come awards. So. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's may something, say something about our age though, Terry. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. we, we, yeah, that's right. We, we say young people are closer and closer to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thinking in a few years from now, the, our up and coming award is going to be 50 and under. So. <laughs> <laughs> 50 yeah. is the new, the, the new 35, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's right. All right. Well, Terry, let's get to the dad joke and then we can get Scott in here after a quick uh, ad. And and uh, yeah, well, this is, but here's the moment that everybody's been waiting for. Well, uh, all the regulators know that I love The Walking Dead. So I have a zombie uh, dad joke. You ready? <laughs> I, I, when I saw when I saw it, I'm like, of course, this is Terry's dad. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Uh, Aaron, did you hear how the zombie bodybuilder hurt his back? I did not, Terry. How did he hurt his back? He was deadlifting. <laughs> <laughs> I even see it and it still makes me chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, Aaron. Hey, hey, before we dive in, we want to thank everyone for checking out the Two Regular Guys podcast. If you are listening to the podcast version, we would appreciate you sharing with your friends so they can become regulators too. Plus, we uh, would love and appreciate you giving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening to the show. And we are always looking for new guests. If you or anyone you know would like to join us, go to calendly.com slash two. That's uh, the number two, regular guys with your show ideas. <laughs> if you're watching us live right now, join in with your comments and questions. Reach out to industry friends right now so they can join us too. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Jeff says he tunes in for the dad jokes, but stays for the content. So I guess <laughs> I guess we better deliver I some content. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's hear a, a quick word from our sponsor, Impressions, and uh, then we will get to Scott. I'm excited. What is Impressions Expo? Impressions Expo, formerly known as ISS, is the premier trade show dedicated to the imprinted and decorated apparel industry. They have five shows that are produced annually in each region of the United States, including Long Beach, California, Atlantic City, New Jersey, Orlando, Florida, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and cap off the year at Fort Worth, Texas. Each of those five annual shows also feature over 30 seminars and hands-on workshops in categories such as screen printing, embroidery, digitizing, digital decorating, and much, much more. Visit ImpressionsExpo.com for more details, and while there, use the promo code REGULARGUYSIE for a free expo pass. Again, make sure you visit ImpressionsExpo.com to get more details, and the two regular guys look forward to seeing you there. All right. Well, thanks very much to Impressions for their continued support. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they've got coming up for 2021 for sure. So, Absolutely. Terry, uh, Christine said, nope, I cannot allow that one. So your your dad joke was denied <laughs> by, by Christine. So um, <laughs> I usually have a backup one, but I don't have one today. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> well, I'm sure uh, Todd or, or any of the other regulators can maybe see if they can get one in there for Christine that would meet her approval. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Terry, let's get Scott in here. We got lots to talk about and then uh, this is going to be a blast. So uh, I'll let you introduce him and then we'll uh, get to chatting. 
I, I, by the way, I've never heard of a dad joke so bad that it it's not a dad joke. It's been <laughs> but, uh, Isn't that the point? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it wasn't bad enough. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You might know Scott Ritter as the president of the Decorated Apparel Expo, but did you know that Scott ran his own chain of screen printing and embroidery shops for roughly 25 years, developed the pricing formula that is used uh, by most successful shops in the industry, and is the author of nearly 300 articles that ran in nearly every magazine in the industry, was an early digitizer, and is an expert in hand color separations for screen printing. Scott has also served on the board of directors for SGIA, has won the Magnus Award, Outstanding Service Award, and a couple of dozen other top awards in our industry. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hey, how you guys doing today? Awesome. We're, we're doing great. Uh, you know, and, and the, the crazy part is, Scott, uh, you know, I've known you for a little bit now, and, and I didn't know half of that stuff, honestly. So this is uh, really exciting for me to... to this is just really bad on me. I need to get to know my friends better. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's face it, the way Terry explains it, I mean, I can just feel my head going. I mean, do these headphones make my head look fat now? <laughs> they, they do, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, all well, right, well, I appreciate you guys inviting me to be on the show, and I want to say hello to all the regulators, and thanks so much for having me here today. Yeah, we, we're uh, we're excited to have you as well, and like I said, I'm really excited to to get to know you better here. So let's let's start right back in the early days. Uh, help us out. Talk to us about the early days. Your entrance into the decorating industry. Where was that? Well, when you talk about the early days, you would have to be talking about when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and I must be one of them. Actually, I had a triceratops who used to work in the screen reclaiming department, but every time you called him, he turned his head and ripped all the screens with the horn. Yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Never, and we had never we had a T Rex in the screen, you know, operating one of the screen presses, but he could only do little left crest designs. Those kind of alarms. Uh, all right but, so, reality okay, so, though <laughs> reality i'm going to prove exactly what kind of a dinosaur i am and you guys probably are not because i'm going to hold up something here and i'm going to see if either of you guys can identify what was the screen printer's absolute best friend in 1975 let me see here terry I, i've got nothing so <laughs> i is that um oh i think i i think i know what that is it's uh for grabbing onto fabric and pulling it over the edge when you staple or glue? You have guessed it, as a matter of fact. There <laughs> were no screen stretching devices yet. So when you took out a screen, which would be a hunk of this stuff made into four <laughs> corners and uh, ready for you to staple onto, you would lay the screen down, place the fabric across it, do something to hold one end. I don't even remember what we used to do for that. And you'd pull as hard as you could, staple, 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 Paul, stable, stable, stable. And, you know, that's how you got a screen. And if it didn't wave in the wind, you'd done well. <laughs> Mine was more like a vice grip, but with with uh, the the mouth of it was like eight inches wide. And, uh, but, and, and, you know, Scott, I thought I had become the king of uh, screen stretching when I got my electric stapler. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be honest, I was trying to use my electric stapler the other day. And after 40 years, it died on me. <laughs> what? Hey. Yeah, exactly. Wow. But I what, think you need to give Sears a call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but at any rate, uh, so that was 1975. That was when I printed my first shirt. Uh, actually, I was in high school at the time. By the time I owned my own shop in 1983, funny that you mentioned 1983 in the intro, Terry, because I don't think you do that. <laughs> no. Yeah. By 1983, a great new invention had occurred for screen frames, and it's right here, the groove in the bottom of the wood. Aaron? Take a guess at that one. What's that for? <laughs> I had no, no idea. <laughs> I really couldn't. Uh, let's see here. S somewhere to, to uh, I don't know, get, get better tension by putting the staple down in there? Nope. Tell them, Terry. Nope. Okay. It's kind of like your screen door. You, you have the fabric laying across the screen. Then you have this, uh, this cord and a little tool to push the cord down in. And the further down into the slot you pushed it, the tighter the screen. So ah. we were, uh, yeah, we were like cavemen. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, the good news is the Chinese invented silk screening like 1000 AD or something like that, as I recall. And their frames were porcelain. 
you and I have no experience with porcelain, fortunately. <laughs> That's true. I was going to say, did you guys have to go harvest your own silk? What the heck is going on here? <laughs> well, you know, that's another thing. Back in 1975, uh, screen printing supply houses were few and far between. And usually a screen printer would go out and buy silk. Or if you wanted to cheap out, you got organdy, which was kind of a synthetic rayon material that was similar to screens. But, you know, mesh counts, et cetera. I mean, this is all science that was almost completely unknown in 75. Uh, really only starting to begin to be known in the really professional shops um yeah i mean it was just amazing it was the wild wild west kind of like when i started digitizing nobody sold backing you had to go out to fabric stores and get something for backing when you were going to do, do us uh, your embroidery yeah you know looking back on those days and 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 cutting ruby lith with you know with a with, with your swivel uh knife and it was we're gonna uh, talk about that <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want to jump ahead. <laughs> no, fine, but go ahead. No, I just meant, uh, and uh, and white ink was like uh, white roofing tar. I mean, yeah. it, it was it was not easy to do in those days, and uh, and uh, it, it's uh, it's certainly come a long way, you know. But and and a lot of things are still the same, though. You know, I, I teach screen printing classes. Uh, well, before COVID, I taught screen printing classes, <laughs> and. And you know there are a lot of things that that are done exactly the same way as when I started screen printing. Are you ready? Forty-one years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're almost as big a dinosaur as I am. Okay. One last <laughs> question, so Aaron can redeem himself. Name the screen printer's tool I'm holding up. <laughs> it's a hammer. It's a hammer. I got this one. <laughs> you failed. Uh, Tell yeah, them, it's, a, it's a registration device. It is a micro registration <laughs> device. <laughs> because screen printing presses had clamps and that was it. There was no registration device. If you were off by like a quarter of an inch, <laughs> knock that puppy into place. I thought it would just be, you just tap it with your palm. I don't, you oh, know. no, because it always just goes right back where it was with that. You need something much more solid. Okay. I, I used to run a, a, a precision jumbo oval that, uh, that would print 22 by 30. And so our registration device on that was a, was a long-handled rubber mallet. So yep. the guys could reach all the way out to the end <laughs> and tap it into Oh, place. those are beautiful machines, though, Terry. <laughs> and we were printing six color designs with, with yep. that using the hammer registration method. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, I think it was 1992 when Antec came out with the Tracer, the very first uh, micro registration device. So, yeah, there was a whole lot of screen printing and presses that uh, occurred long before micro registration existed. You know, when I teach my classes, Scott, I. Uh, I, I show people how to register screens without using micros and and they ask me you know if somebody always says well why don't you use the micros and I said I'll, I'll have to be honest I learned to register screens before there were micros and so yep. now it's just easier for me to do it that you know do it without but uh, you know I, I always encourage folks that hey when you get your new press learn to use your micros but yep yep and <laughs> one of these days we'll we'll have to revisit this I, I, uh, as i told you beforehand um i have a huge collection of some of my wonderful work that i've done over the years uh some really groundbreaking stuff like that and i couldn't find it after the move so ah. i do have some stuff from the rag bag that i will show you here but at some point we're going to do a podcast from my print lab which is another building but the internet over there's still a little shaky to, to you know <laughs> it, it goes through three different routers to get there at this point so but i will show you my hopkins reggie press do you remember the reggie from 1994 i believe i don't specifically remember i mean i certainly remember hopkins presses but i don't oh, remember absolutely. the reggie right huh. and of course hopkins was the first one to bring out the antec micro registration system and then they split off and antec made their own presses but the reggie was what they came out with when antec left them where basically the press has two clamps one that clamps in a piece of metal and the other that clamps the screen and so you can loosen up the one on the metal and slide it around as you need it it was the most hated instrument ever created in the industry <laughs> and i have one <laughs> so yeah so you were uh, on the bleeding edge at that point then <laughs> well actually you, i didn't buy it original i bought that second hand when i uh so when i left uh, our shop and uh it's like you know i really still want to own a screen printing press and i found a guy who had this one i was like oh that's perfect because you know that thing's absolutely famous for how bad it was <laughs> you certainly don't want to keep it so i'm sure it's a good price <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know when you you think about all the all the uh items that have come and gone over the years when you were talking about that uh, i remembered that uh remember the hat uh press that was air pressure 
And so you you had ink on it, and you hit the air pressure, and it was supposed to push the ink through the screen. Right. I and, almost bought one. <laughs> I almost bought one too, and I understand the people that did said, "Yeah, it never came through the screen evenly." Yeah, <laughs> it was. Well, one as of those, they say, that which hits the fan will not be distributed evenly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. Uh, all right. Well, okay. let's keep. Well, let's keep let's go yeah. ahead and talk about my career then, as long as we're you know done with the show and tell. Uh, yeah. One last show and tell, Adam. I found this just the other day from 1983 uh, when I opened up. Uh, the shirt affair, my very first shop, the local paper ran a little interest story about that. And there's a picture of a very, very young Scott Ritter. Scott Terry laughing his head off. <laughs> and, awesome. and it in, says in, the shirt in your, affair. Uh, three quarter sleeve baseball shirt that everybody Those were wore then. hot at the time. They were yep. huge. <laughs> yep, yep. And we had a gimmick because we had figured out that you can put that sideways in the heat press and print the name down the sleeve, as you'll see. You can see the little black lettering going down the sleeve. Oh, that was hot stuff. Yeah, yeah we, we, were, we were big boys. But you'll see that I'm next to a wall of transfers, and it says how transfers are a uh, specialty for the shirt affair. And let me quickly explain that. Uh, when I got out of college uh, with a degree that basically included media arts as well as business management, um, I started up an advertising company. We had offset presses and everything like that. And uh, we put out a bunch of stuff. And suddenly decided, you know, I've got a background in printed apparel as well. And that could be a nice little sideline that we could add to our advertising company. And Terry, I think I'm going to pick on you again this time. Uh, tell us a little bit about how sublimation got started and its evolution in the industry, if you would. <laughs> well, I used to screen print uh, sublimation ink onto 20 yep. pound typing paper, copy paper, paper to everybody who's uh, younger <laughs> than 45. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, I used to screen print. It was a uh, and and every every print looked like it was gray <laughs> until you heat applied it onto yep. all those trucker hats. And uh, but yeah, you'd, I'd go to the uh, to the campus bookstore and buy sh buy reams of uh, of twenty pound paper and yep. uh, and screen print those. And then then I had an express machine that uses used the you know they they I guess as did I yeah and and it was more of a powder system. But man. I, I paid for that machine a thousand times over by doing uh, lots of plaques for softball teams, things like that. Yep. Any any picture from the newspaper you could put on the plaque because yep. it was all, all those new pa newspaper pictures were half tone dots. Exactly. And so they were perfect for sublimation. But go ahead and tell us your, <laughs> no, your no, sublimation no. story. I, now finish up because we moved on some stages since then, Terry. Well, yeah. Well, Aaron, you want to talk about today's <laughs> sublimation? He's Aaron's our sublimation. That's how I guy. do it. Still, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's all just black and white. I, I, yeah. I mean, for my, and I certainly got into this much later. I mean, uh, you know, within the last ten years. So, you know, it, it was inkjet by the time I got to it. I didn't realize there was anything else. I honestly thought that was the way that it was done. It came off of a <laughs> an inkjet printer, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so t tell me, Scott. <laughs> okay, it goes back considerably further because GANS, an offset printing ink company, was the first to bring out sublimation inks. And if you take a look in the picture, you'll see that there's a bunch of kind of washed out looking stuff there. Those are all sublimation prints from 1983, one of which was printed in 90, 1991, that, or 81, excuse me. I found that in the rag bag. This is probably going to be the earliest sublimation print you've ever seen. That oh is the gosh. print that you see in the picture right there. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. It's a, and it's a two color because with offset, you can easily do multiple colors. I mean, you can have full color designs like Terry's talking. All the trucker hats all had a white polyester front, you know, which, you know, sublimation was great on that. I mean, most people were screen printing on them, but they were made for sublimation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we got into it because our advertising company had offset presses and it's like, you know, wow. I mean, here's this great opportunity. We can knock out incredible hats because every hat was white front at the time anyway. Mm -hmm. And we could put in full color. We could do it for less than a screen printer could do it. So yeah, we had this wonderful venue to be able to get into the industry. And that was how the shirt affair started. Uh, it wasn't a whole long time. Oh, it wasn't a whole long time before uh, the shirt affair added, well, already had screen printing, but we added a, a nice Aztec four color press. You've heard of the Aztec, right, Terry? No, mm, I don't remember that. It was uh, a piece of garbage, <laughs> <laughs> but it was inexpensive and it got us going. And we suddenly realized, uh, hey, this is a piece of garbage. And we 
upgraded to a four color carousel press uh, very soon after that, which, I mean, everybody had that. Nobody had more than four colors in a manual shop. It was always a four color press. Right. But I did find also in the rag bag from about 1984, excuse me, 84, uh, a promotional shirt that we had done for the shirt affair. And this is entirely a hand cut shirt of a parrot. And the shirt affair logo, the palm tree, etc. And as you're looking at it, remember this is only four colors, and it was hand cut. Uh, I became something of a whiz at hand color cutting, and managed to create a whole lot of stuff for us and for our other customers. Uh, when you hand cut, I just took a piece of line art and I put it on a piece of paper here, just, just before the show to describe this. Here I've got it's kind of even hard to tell as a black and white, but I've got books between two bookends. Mm -hmm. And what you would do is you would create this on film because everything screen printing at the time was photographic or hand cut itself. As a matter of fact, back in 1975, whether you did hand cut or whether you did photographic, you actually uh, put your film positive onto the emulsion itself while it was still on the carrier, exposed it, washed it out, and then adhered it to the screen. I'm sure that predates anything you ever did, Terry, because I just find <laughs> that amazing today that that actually works. It does. That you had to put. You know, if you hand cut, you were hand cutting on the carrier, on the plastic carrier, you know, and when you cut away everything that, you know, was supposed to print, then you were able to wet it down and adhere it to your screen. Kind of like the direct indirect emulsions today, except for, of course, you know, now we expose them on the screen afterward because it's a whole lot more accurate. But at any rate, you took your, uh, fil your film positive just like this. And if this one was supposed to be blue, you'd cut that one out with a piece of ruby lith. You put ruby lith over this and cut away. You'd weed away everything that you didn't need. And you cut it with an X-Acto knife uh, using a material called ruby lith, which, I mean, Terry, you and I have done so much ruby lith that we can still smell the stuff. <laughs> exactly. Remember the smell of ruby lith? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's I'm sure of in one of those boxes in my garage, I've got... It's kind of a candy and formaldehyde thing. <laughs> yeah. mm, sounds <laughs> delicious. <laughs> so you got, you know, blue here, you got green here. So you've got four colors to work with. Uh, so you got blue, you got yellow, you got orange, you got red. Well, for your blue ink, you'll cut this one and the green one, and you'll put those both in solid. Now, the neat thing is from there, I can cut a red right here in my orange, and I'll just cut those two as a single block of ruby lith as well and go down through the line when it comes time to go to the press what we were able to do is by using the order of our screens correctly we would lay down first the red or the blue depending upon how the color order worked then we would do the red and then we put the yellow over them so when i put yellow over the red i would get an orange when i put the yellow over a blue i would get a green and of course you def depending upon how you mixed your inks, it would depend on what your, your mixed color would look like. And then, of course, when I finally do the black, that squishes everything together and you finally get your color. Wow. Now, you can, you can do that a lot more exacting. And I wish I had an example of uh, one of the ones that I did hand color because I've got some beautiful ones that I did that were just magnificent with like 12 colors out of four. But uh, later on, a company called Format released sheets of halftone dots. So you could have a, a sheet of 60 dot or a 60 line half tone at uh, 10, 20 percent, etc. And you can just take and cut some of that off, put it on top of your ruby lift that you've already peeled, cut away the borders, and you could have a half tone border here so that you could come up with a light yellow or a light blue or something like that. You know, and you can make all kinds of shades. I mean, just like our computers do today, but back then, like I said, everything was photographic. You had huge view cameras that you'd use for creating your film positives. Uh, we had what looked like a big photographic enlarger that could do typesetting, including an arcs. It was called a sporty. You probably don't need that. That you may remember, Terry. I, I do, don't know. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I had a sporty <laughs> as a matter of fact, along with also a linotype, uh, one that just did uh, film in a strip that you could lay out. Uh, you used what was called photo mechanical transfers, where basically you would shoot something onto a piece of film and you'd have a piece of transparency. You'd link them together. They ran through the developer. You peeled them. And just like a Polaroid, you had your piece of film ready to go. You're all, you're you all probably lost a couple of people on Polaroid also. <laughs> your Polaroid lane camera. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Take the shot. Peel it off. <laughs> yeah. Shake it. <laughs> yeah, you somehow shake it. you thought it would it would go faster if you shook it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Everybody did. Yep. But yeah, I mean, I, I used to have some great examples of hand color cutting. Now, I do have one here that's pretty nice. It has some uh, stuff in it. This is also a promotional shirt that we did for Northwind. 
later on because our screen printing company became known as Northwind. Our retail store is the Shirt Affair. So is the Shirt Affair Northwind stores as we spread out. But this one here is only a three color. And the silver was magnificent in its time because, yes, it's oxidized now, but that was like looking at shiny aluminum on the shirt. We had white. And then, of course, what we did is we took halftone screens in the camera and uh, we drew out our earth with the blue and with the white comet. And we made halftones, glued up everything in place. And this was all done hand color cut. And all the halftones in the earth, once again, are a drawing from a photograph of the earth that was put together. It was shaded and shot through a halftone screen in the camera to be able to create this image. Yeah. I guess the message that's what we're taking away for people who are watching today is that not everything you do has to be uh, created on the computer. Sometimes there are actually applications where you may want to draw something and, well, you know, these days you can scan it and print it out on your computer so you don't have to have a complete darkroom. But there are some techniques where once in a while it really does pay to use something photographic even today. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I, I think we're all just mesmerized here. We've got some comments. Uh, Todd Downing says, I don't want to get out of the car. This is great stuff. Um, so, uh, what uh, what interesting, amazing things that you were able to to go through back uh, then to to kind of get to this phase. What what an incredible time, Terry. Are, is all the facts checking out so far? The facts are all checking out exactly. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, I, I went through the rag bag because we had work t-shirts we used for building the new facility. As you can see, the window behind me is actually not completely finished. Oh, and what's really fun is you guys were talking about the weather. Uh, I bought a new snow plow last it, it arrived last saturday i've already had to use it <laughs> we had eight inches of snow this week uh, uh -huh. up north where we used to be in grand rapids minnesota i've had to plow eight inches of snow three times already this year wow wow just it, it's an it's an amazing time and christine that snow is on its way to you. you get coming, huh? <laughs> Let me go through the rag bag and just show you some of the stuff that I did find even though it isn't my spectacular sure. stuff that i really want to show off sure. uh 1992 I was in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. That's the birthplace of Judy Garland. We did a play, The Wizard of Oz. I actually played a small bit part in it. But this was one of the very early computer-driven art pieces that we did. Uh, probably the neatest effect that it was capable of doing was that uh, you know the uh, distortion of the type in The Wizard of Oz. Uh, arcing around an object didn't even exist just yet in this particular software. But this was a four-color process separation done on a 386 computer and printed out on a Cume Crystal Print um, printer. And back then you couldn't get an 11 by 17 printer. This was printed on eight and a half by 11. And we sorted out such that the, the black title at the top was on a sheet, the design uh, that's full color yeah. is in the middle of the sheet and the type at the bottom was on another <laughs> sheet and we tiled it all together when we were done. Wow. <laughs> Another one done the same way because this one is also nine. This one's nineteen ninety three. I hey, think. Hey Scott, your part yeah. in that play were you one of the lollipop league or? I was not. <laughs> <laughs> I actually played a triple role. I was the I was Uncle Henry. I was the mayor of the Munchkin City. Now that was fun. <laughs> and also, I was the palace guard who, you know, had to sing the ah 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 oh oh oh. You know, all that stuff. I'm not going to get into singing. Get get Vance Cahill if you want singing. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another one from the rag bag. Here's Terry was talking about the bulletproof whites we had to work with. This one was from 1993, excuse me. And this is a radio station in Grand Rapids that basically every year had a annual bed race. And they gave us carte blanche to do anything as spectacular as possible. Partially because of the fact they were going to trade out the money in advertising anyway. So we could go, you know, to any kind of budget that we wanted to create anything. So another piece of early screen printed art uh, done on black on a six color javelin. And, um, you know, kind of impressive for its time. It's not too bad. Had a three color back as well. But uh, nice print on darks on a forest green there. The next year, something brand new happened in the industry. And once again, they gave us carte blanche to do anything we wanted. And it's faded a bit over time. It's not as spectacular as it once was. <clears throat> do you know what kind of ink we're looking at there, Terry? I'm not sure. Well, let me just kind of crinkle it up and you'll see that, uh, you know, there's no rigidity to the ink. That is an early discharge print. 
<laughs> when Discharge first came out, you mixed your own ink. There were five parts to the chemicals. You yeah. had to mix in your urea. You had your base. You had your pigments. And I don't even remember what all. Charlie Tobley had to go through the whole thing with me, as a matter of fact. But, yeah, we did this incredible shirt. And it's like, well, you know, it feels like sublimation, but it's on purple. And, you know, you've got your whites and you got all like that. And so, yeah, early discharge, which obviously discharge has become a whole lot bigger, but there were only a couple brands of shirts that could support it. Uh, at the time, this was a Fruit of the Loom, uh, Made in America, Fruit of the Loom XL, and they had a pigment dye that was capable of supporting discharge. And, of course, they were pushing that. The companies that made Discharge Inc., they were pushing the fact they had it. And it was really a neat process. And really a forerunner to getting people back into water base. In 1973, or five, excuse me, when I first printed it in school, I don't know if the industry had more, but if you were going to print on garments, you used a water-based ink. You did not use plastisol. Right. If you wanted to print on, if you wanted to make transfers, you used plastisol, which is a new invention anyway, because prior to that, as you came into the 1960s, they did have heat transfers. We called them iron-ons, which was a term that we really had a hard time beating out of the industry because they weren't iron-ons. You needed a heat press to make this work. But they had iron-ons, and your ink was actually a paraffin base. So you were actually melting wax into the shirt to make the iron-on work. And if you received an iron-on to put on your T-shirt as a promo, you could probably get three presses out of it. You get a little lighter each time. But you could print three garments with one transfer. You know, it's like, oh, look, I've got three versions of this. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> you, you know, Scott, when uh, in, in my screen printing classes, uh, I'll have somebody uh, raise their hand and say, hey, uh, do you know anything about this new discharge ink? And I always <laughs> say, no, I know about the old discharge ink that's back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it just kind of revolves over and over again. But, you but know, it's improved so much. And you, know, oh. you don't have to mix five parts to make it anymore. And it right. doesn't and stink up the place so badly. I was just going to say that. It doesn't smell like rotten eggs anymore. No, <laughs> no. Because that was the awful part is basically if you didn't have a dryer with a really, really good evacuation system, you didn't want to be using that stuff. That, that stuff it was awful. It smelled And horrible, I believe it was but, toxic. Uh, yeah, well, it has formaldehyde in it. So, but, and, and you know, you're talking about water-based. Do you remember early Puff Ink? And uh, it was all water-based, right? And, yep. And if, if you hadn't used it for a little while, you took the lid off. You had to scrape the mold off the top. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I will go you one more. Do you remember suede ink, Terry? Oh, heck yeah. Okay, because yeah. that was one of my favorites, QCM. And it was a plastisol-based puff, which was really nice. It was a very nice innovation that they finally come to. But I think all they did is they, they overstocked the ink on the blowing agent so that it would blow and fall apart. But, yeah, after you got done with it, it came out of the dryer. And it felt like rubbing your hand over suede. It was great. We did a lot of rodeo stuff and uh, shirts with yeah. suede ink. And I kept one of those. I wish I could find it here today because that is really neat-looking stuff. You, you know, Scott, I did an article uh, probably 20 years ago talking about suede ink, and it was it was uh, something to the effect of the specialty ink that no one's ever heard of. I could yep. write that article again today, and uh, again, people don't know about that, but but it's readily available. And, Is uh, it? Okay, because I oh, have yeah, not seen it anywhere. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a... Um, uh, you know, a, a, a base and you mix color in it. And okay. yeah, I, I, we sometimes print it in my classes still. And, and the reason I do is because again, everyone in the class is like, I've never seen that before. And, and, Does you it know, hold it, up it, any better? Uh, it holds up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cause uh, back it, then you expected 10 washes and you told the customer. Yeah, so yeah, it, 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 it does hold up better than that. I think the reason that people don't know about it is because it says suede puff and then people print it through like an 87 mesh because that's what you print puff through and it doesn't work with yeah. suede. You have to print it through like a two thirty, And I think that people get it, try it doesn't work and they move on. So I used to use a one ten and a very aggressive screen ang uh, squeegee angle and it worked uh, very nice. <laughs> yeah. But then again, what works for one printer with a one ten is another printer is one seventy three or a two thirty, Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, it all depends on your technique. Yeah. Aaron's staring like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys see the glazed over look? No, I, I love it. I mean, this is great. We've got comments coming in. Um, you know, Jerry says, uh, sounds like things in screen printing has gotten a little easier for us. Oh, my gosh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Todd, Todd said, sounds like kids these days have it made. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, it is really interesting and amazing and fascinating. You know, what, what and, and so, like I said, today, what you've got available to you, you know, you should be printing amazing things. You don't have Absolutely. to go through this stuff that yeah, you guys have to of, go through. Yeah, say nothing of your ability to uh, 
put something on a wide format cutter with vinyl and be able to boom, you've got a transfer right away that, you know, that holds up, that isn't sublimation, that's nice and bright, um, can do a lot of things, even metallics and stuff like that just wasn't available. Now, I do remember, Terry, you're going to remember this as well. It used to be if you wanted something really bright metallic, you screen printed a plastisol onto the shirt, usually in uh, something the way of a bronze color, and then you would take it over to the heat press and press foil onto it, and you would foil the shirts. They still do it today, as a matter of fact. Oh, sure. At the time, that was all you could do. Yeah, uh, again, in my classes, at least in Chicago, we, we always do foil in the class because mainly, you know, it's not like people are necessarily going to go home and do foil uh, unless you're in Vegas and that's all you'll do. But, uh, <laughs> and rhinestones. but I like to show people, hey, you know, you don't have to just print, you know, a two color Jim's towing service. Aaron loves when I talk about Jim's towing service, but, but I got to uh, buy some shirts. <laughs> there's a lot of really cool things you can do, cool effects that, that really don't cost you very much, but it's, it's a great uh, value add to the, to the print. So yeah. just because I found on the rag bag, I'm going to show, show this one last time. This was the snooze cruise. It was basically pretty cutting edge in 1993. And just to give you a comparison to the rest of the industry, I just happened to find this sitting around. It used to be when you went to a trade show, somebody was printing and giving away T-shirts. And they always had to be something pretty spectacular. But there's 1997 SGIA, which was you know the biggest oh, yeah. show in the industry. you know, And that's what they were showing off. And it's not bad. Technically, it's not bad, even though it's on white. You know, It's got some technical merit to it, but it's not that spectacular. That doesn't mean that things didn't pick up because here's one that I picked up at SGI 19, uh, 2003, also not my product again. But take a look at this, Georgia Peach. Oh, I know. I and have I'm that shirt. about the gal. Do you remember what's special about this one, Terry? Because I'm sure you were there. I, I was there and I have that shirt, but I don't, I don't recall what, what, what was special about it. It came with 3D glasses. That's right. Oh. I, it I was printed yeah. with a dot angle such that you could use 3D glasses. And yes, it actually does pop a little bit. It's, it's not like looking at a lenticular frame or something like that, but it actually did work. Somebody spent a lot of time designing this piece of art so that you could put on your 3D glasses and that would pop out and look three-dimensional for you. Yeah, I, I remember that one because I was with Scott Presner at the time, and I think Scott was involved in separating that thing. So oh, that um, could be very probable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can't remember who designed it though, but uh, it, uh, I, I want to say Dane, but uh, I, I could be wrong. So um, interesting. That, that's a cool piece. Yeah, it sure. doesn't quite look like Dane's work to me, but it is certainly his caliber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can't remember exactly. Well, well, I'll I'll find out. That 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 one does stand out to me because I do remember that, and I remember the three D glasses. Um, yep. uh, somewhere in my basement, I think I have a pair of those three D glasses that came with the shirt. <laughs> and, and just to make you guys feel good to know that you are part of, of you know printing history as well, there is one last piece of screen printing that I wanted to show. Actually, it's not even screen print; it's direct to garment. And Aaron and Terry can be blamed for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the screen print color jacket. <laughs> that is uh, Wade Rowan written all over it. <laughs> yep, Wade Rowan definitely designed that. I'll let you that guys print. explain that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there was a time where Scott Fresner was certain that screen printing had about two years of life left. I recall. Fact, yeah, he would. Uh, he and I had he, that discussion several times. Oh, he and I did too, because he would walk into the classroom and uh, and and introduce himself, hold up the How to Print T-shirts book, and say, "Hi, I'm Scott Fresner." And uh, uh, screen printing, and I know you've flown from all over the country for this screen printing class. It's going to be dead in two years. It'll all be direct to garment. Uh, here's Terry; he's going to teach your class. And <laughs> and I would say before you left the room, that is exactly incorrect. Screen print is not going anywhere. <laughs> he actually came up to me a few years ago at a trade show and said. You know, all those times you said that screen printing is not going anywhere. You were right. I was wrong. <laughs> Good news. You won. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, see, That's I always just won. thought it was tongue in cheek. So uh, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> just, just to be able to bring Eric back to the show now, uh, I do have two pieces of embroidery that I discovered in the rag bag as well. So I want to quickly talk about that. Uh, in 19, oh gosh, probably 1989, we brought in our first digitizing system. And we actually waited until digitizing came down to an affordable price for starters, because when I first bought our first 
uh, embroidery machine in 1985. It was made in America. It was a brand called Ultramatic that no longer exists and hasn't in many, many years. But at any rate, when you digitized, you had a giant tablet. Uh, the one they sold was six foot wide, four foot tall. It was full of little tiny micro sensors and you had a puck that was cabled to this tablet and to the computer. And so you could trace things out. You blew up your art to six times the size that you wanted it to be. And you would tape it onto this board and you would trace out points to be able to digitize this. Not too dissimilar from what you do with on-screen digitizing today, except for the fact that it had to be done there. You could, If you wanted color artwork, you had to have some sort of a color printer that you could tile out that big. Normally the art was hand printed, but we, you know, once again, using the same system as we did for our screen printing separations, we would tile it out on our special laser printer, which at the time was special. These days, it's a joke. But, you know, that's just the evolution of the industry. So at any rate, in order to digitize, you had this enormous tablet. And those tablets were $40,000 a piece. It yeah. broke my heart to throw that thing into the dump one day because it no longer had any use whatsoever except for, you know, if you could find somebody who actually wanted a drafting board, you know. And no, you can't. Did, did you take it to the dump the same day you took your stat camera? <laughs> 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 no, they wouldn't both fit in the same load. <laughs> but other than that, yes. Unfortunately, you are right. Um, but at any rate, so you, you basically put everything up on this and you would digitize it six times size by hand. You know, uh, your digitizing software usually had the ability to do running stitches. Mine had a bean stitch as well. It uh, also had your fill stitch available and your column stitch. And that was pretty much it. And... What was really bizarre about digitizing back in 1985 when we got our first embroidery machine is you would type everything on here. Then you'd go over to your embroidery machine, hit a button, and whatever you just shot into this tablet would embroider out on your sample shirt. And if you did it wrong, well, you had to back it up, you know, and you would embroider over it once again, um, you know, until you actually got a design that hopefully when you did your final sew, it was going to look something like what you wanted. And I don't even know how they edited a design if they had problems after they actually digitized. You put out your design on eight channel paper tape, kind of like the, t well, like the ticker tapes they used to throw in New York, you know, a little strip of tape and that was where your design was, <laughs> was on wow. paper tape. Well, we waited for the evolution. Larry Lawley, who still runs Data Stitch, brought computerized uh, digitizing to the industry where a computer, a 286 computer, was what you fed your tablet to. So you could see everything on screen. You back it up and erased itself. Oh, this was wonderful stuff. I think that system was 80,000. And I managed to get one from a company that had bought one and closed. So I got it for like 50,000. I was, I was king of the hill, let me tell you right now. Eric's but probably going crazy in the background right now, wanting, wanting to participate. <laughs> <laughs> you can see him for sure. And uh, Jump he, in, Aaron. <laughs> he says, uh, even when I started uh, my first seat of a major digitizing system software still had a cost of 16,000. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at today, you know, I used to sell an auto digitizing software for $300 and that was a long time ago. And these days it just comes with the machine. Yeah. <laughs> at any rate, uh, logo for my software company that I know you're going to want to talk about later, but here's the logo for my software company that was done on that tablet at the time. Wow. That and was awesome. It is. And remember, all you had available was fill stitch, column stitch, and running stitches. As you see the gradient up here, that was something that only a couple of digitizers in the country were willing to try and tap into. And I decided, hey, that's going to be in our logo. So basically what I did is I put this all together up on the tablet. I did it at 12 times size. So it filled the entire tablet to make this little tiny left crest. And I drew lines at varying distances, measured them off at the rolling ruler, and created these lines going across and ran them as walking stitches to create the gradients. It took a while, but the, you know, for the time, it was absolutely spectacular. People went crazy over it. That's and actually, awesome. I wish I'd have found the other shirt. Uh, we used to have a shirt like this that had the same logo. And on the back, it had a multimedia design. I'll have to see if I can find one of those because I know they exist. It had a multimedia where basically it was tackle tool that was sublimation printed. It was, it was supported by embroidery because it was uh, applique on. And it was all applique on top of a screen print. So it had every printing method imaginable on it. And we would be sitting at a trade show showing off our software products. And all of a sudden, feel some whoa. Somebody just touched your back to see what, what made that screen glow because it was a piece of white tackle twill with a sublimation print on it. So it just kind of glowed like it really was a movie screen. You know, and everybody just had to touch it. You know, and people would actually reach out and touch this stranger sitting there giving a demo as all of a sudden just, whoa. Oh, okay. Well, somebody touched my back again. 
All right. Here's another one that I did show Aaron, and uh, I'm going to grab it just because I have it sitting here. But also, once again, on that same tablet, digitized it about four times actual size. This was our Northwind Company jackets. And, uh, yeah, that was actually the artist's representation of me skiing because I used to be an aerial freestyle skier. Note the bands on the knee for doing moguls because my knees were shot, so he thought that was really funny. <laughs> uh, and you know of course the north wind logo but uh one of the neat things about this digitizing software is one of the later versions that i got of it offered something called a feather stitch so these are all in the snow what makes this little blast of snow is stitches that are basically a column stitch but one side is a varied length so it just you know one stitch will be up here the next one down here you know and it just makes this random edge on one side or on both sides and create created the look that you actually had snow here and of course different directions gave it uh, all kinds of texture very happy with that one that one was put on tape paper tape it took four rolls of paper tape to hold that one <laughs> it was 108,000 stitches and it took eight hours to run on the old machines wow that's insane. yeah because they weren't as fast back <laughs> All right, hey, Terry. Well, let's keep moving here. Yeah. Hey, Scott. You. I think uh, Aaron and I both met you when you were doing your software business. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, SMR Software basically uh, was a a growth out of our screen printing company because first of all, we had to be able to price our product adequately. We needed to keep track of our orders. We needed some computerization. And fun little fact about me, I've been programming computers since 1971. Our school was the third, it was second in the nation, excuse me, to offer computer time to its students. And back then you didn't just slip in a game cartridge and start playing Atari. If you wanted to play with the computer, you had to program it first. Because, you know, there was no off-the-shelf software. You basically right. came in and your operating system was a programming language. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. But at any rate, um, in 1990, I was writing for uh, Screenplay Magazine and the Press Magazine, I believe. I, I wasn't writing for Printware yet. Both of those two are obviously dead, uh, <laughs> along with Shirts Illustrated. Uh, when, do you remember what Windsor's name was so from Windsor Publication, Terry? Oh, I remember him, but not off. I was scratching my head trying to remember his first name, but basically he came out after he'd sold off Impressions Magazine that he created. He decided he wanted to come back into the industry and whatever, you know, and whatever uh, non non trust uh, agreements <laughs> were signed when he sold off the, the magazine were over. And he created his own two new magazines. And I was one of the first writers for them. And I was doing an article on using a spreadsheet software to be able to price screen printing and embroidery. And when I came to embroidery, you needed remainderless division. And in any software programming language, you know, that's just a different operator. You know, instead of using the slash mark, you use like a backslash or something like that, depending upon the pr programming language, to do division that only comes up with the whole number and drops off the remainder. And the spreadsheet couldn't do it. There was no such operation, in which case you cannot price for a forehead machine without remainderless division because you can't have 4.25 runs on the machine. You have to have four or you have to have five. So it ended up sitting there just banging my head. It's like, why doesn't this spreadsheet software have that? Every programming language in the world has, wait a minute. If I did this as a computer program, nobody could screw up the spreadsheet and you know blame me for screwing up their pricing. So about nine months later of you know work in the evenings, Priceless Professional, uh, the first version of Priceless, which was DOS, was born. <laughs> and uh, that got me into programming software for the industry. Uh, at this point, I can only guess, but I believe that Priceless Professional actually runs more shops today than any other software on the market, even though we have not offered a new version of our software in eight years. Wow, that's, and, uh, that's, actually a, that's amazing. The company in quite, you know, about three years ago. Okay. But I did steal this off the building before I sold it because I figured the new owners weren't going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, uh, yes, useful to have there at your home Extremely. office instead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> For our podcast listeners, that is the plaque that says SMR software. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, so, Scott, obviously, yeah, that's where definitely Terry and I met you. So, you know, getting all of this history and, and stuff like that has been amazing. But I think a lot of folks uh, that are tuning in here as regulators today probably know you from the DAX shows. I, I'm, a, I'm assuming that's a probably an easy assumption to make. But uh, one of the things I've always enjoyed thoroughly about all my time at the DAX shows 
are the opening and closing announcements that uh, take place. And and I know the guy that does that. In fact, he's sitting here with us right now. So oh, Carl's uh, here. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have not seen Carl, but Scott is here. So, so Scott, tell, tell us about your your microphone time. I know I know a little bit about that, but uh, tell the regulators about your time behind the microphone. Well, actually, when I was still in high school, I got a job at a local radio station. And I was very lucky to have gotten it just, you know, realistically, just the right guy at the right time who walked in the door and they had a job for in the background for, you know, somebody to be able to operate the request line, take the request. They called it researcher. And it paid very, very well. I think it was $2 an hour. <laughs> yeah. so and this station uh, basically got me very, very interested in broadcasting. I went to school actually with a dual degree in business management and media arts with the intention of becoming uh, the GM, general manager of a radio station. And that would be my career at the time because I was very much into broadcasting and all like that. Um, never really realized that uh, my sinuses, particularly at the, at the time and somewhat today, weren't going to support me sitting on my wallet and running my mouth 24-7, you know, as a career for, you know, day in and day out, and realistically finally had to realize that I've got a little bit more going for myself than to just sit behind a microphone and uh, gab about realistically sometimes nothing. And so, you know, finally- We do that every out. Friday, Scott. I'm just- <laughs> I know. But that's just every Friday. It's not every single day. But at any rate, what was very, very interesting about that is the station that I started at in the background staff went on to be the most famous dead radio station in the world. Because unknown to me, when I joined the staff of this particular radio station, uh, Fairchild Engineering, the people who make the fighter jets, owned U-100. And they had no intention of keeping it because it was this dog they pick it, picked up called WPBC. They put on some new guys and said, hey, do whatever you can with this. You know, make us some revenue out of this, but uh, we're selling this dog. We don't want anything to do with it. Well, the couple of guys who took this on, Rob Sherwood and Mike Siegelman, were absolute masterminds. And Rob Sherwood's a legend in Minneapolis radio. At least he used to be when people still knew him. And uh, what they did was they pulled some stunts. Uh, they created U100 at the state fair. Rob Sherwood sat in the broadcast booth with a handful of people outside and faked going crazy and changed the station from WPBC to U100, changed the format, et cetera. And U100 is actually credited with being the creator of the Rock 40 format, where you have not just top 40, but you've also got recurrence of oldies and a little bit of album rock mixed in. Now, U100, not having to worry about renewing their license, did a lot of things that, well, you know, you were kind of reserved for <laughs> Howard Stern, to be honest. I mean, for a, for a 17-year-old kid, this was a heck of a place to work. <laughs> and our tagline was U100 Boogie or Outrageous. And needless to say, it was outrageous. And I'm going to hold up a shirt that was the shirts that we used to wear at the station and hand it out to the public, uh, particularly you know, to any good-looking gal you know, in the public. But at any rate, this shirt uh, I actually recreated some years ago because it contains a printing technique that nobody uses today that is very, very exciting. And U100 used to have this particular T-shirt, the U100 Grabs Me T-shirt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what you can see is that the hands variegate from a gold at the top to a red in the middle and a blue at the bottom. They do it with one single screen. Right. And I wrote an article on this at decoratedapparelmagazine.com so you can read how to do it because it does involve some special tricks. But basically, you've got a black trap screen doing a hand color cut. And then for the color screen, you've got one color screen and you put your gold at the top, you put your red in the center, you put your blue at the bottom. And on your first pass with the squeegee, you'll just kind of wave it back to mix the inks. And then you have to keep your squeegee as tight as possible in a perfect straight line to keep the blend going without saturating everything and creating mud. But at any rate, it's a great technique for putting together an ocean of color combinations on a single shirt. It works great for sunrises, for oceans, uh, all kinds of stuff that you can do with it. And you never get the exact same result twice. So it's kind of exciting for the customer as well. Yeah. But it does tend to break down and you have to rewash your screens after about 100 prints. <laughs> but I have even seen it done on automatics. The secret of doing wow. that is just to use a little bit of ink. Never add a lot of ink. Right. Just add a little bit of ink. <laughs> if Very you true. add a lot, then all of a sudden you you just have some weird orange color. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's really well, cool. I, we'll get that. Uh, we'll get that link to the the article over there, Decorators uh, Apparel Magazine, and and uh, have that check it out. Charles said uh, fountain print. So yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's Split one of the, a smear of fountain printer. It's to uh, 
not monikers that it normally goes by. I have one more thing I quickly do want to show you a piece yeah. of history. I do have a screen right here that has a screen exposure chart on it. And as you can see, it washed out at the top. But take a look at the frame. This is the first series of Newman roller frames. You can see how thin the bar is. Right. These came out in 1992, 93, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe a hair earlier, changed the industry completely. This is probably the greatest innovation that screen printing's ever seen to date, in my mind. Yeah, and that and, 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 and Sherlock coming out with the screen mesh that would drop into those slots <clears throat> by just drop them in, tighten it up, and you could stretch the screen in about 30 seconds. So, but yeah, yep. uh, Don Newman at Stretch Devices there in Philadelphia revolutionized uh, the, Absolutely. The, the screen printing screen. So, yep. hey, hey, Scott. Just like uh, Matt Rome did with the uh, direct to garment printer. Exactly right. Yep. He, he reminds me of it every time I talk to him. <laughs> I don't doubt that for a moment. <laughs> Just kidding, Matt. <laughs> he wants to be known as the godfather of direct to garment. But you know what? He owned the first patent on the uh, direct to garment printing. So, but Scott, uh, Aaron mentioned the DAC show. Tell us uh, about how that all came about, What the, the evolution of the DAC show. Well, at the time, I was writing for all the magazines still, and uh, they were becoming more and more coastal. Basically, there was this circle going across the nation. We started on the East Coast, worked down to the South and back up the West Coast, and nothing in the middle unless you counted Las Vegas, which I feel that's pretty much way over on the West Coast myself. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing wrong with you folks in Vegas, just that that's where you are. <laughs> that's right. But at yeah, any rate, two mentions uh, today. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, it was just plain a fact that, you know, I, I was trying to convince a number of the companies that I was writing for, hey, you got to have a show. Minneapolis is a huge printing mecca. I mean, realistically, give Minneapolis a try because there's actually more printers per capita there at the time than there were any place else. You know, Chicago was awfully good and Impressions was doing, a me doing I won't say anything bad. They were, they were doing the show, but they weren't really getting the results they wanted, which is why they pulled out of there. Yeah. But at any rate, the Midwest really, really needed a show. Nobody else would do it. And finally, I said, well, okay, I'm going to test the waters. We're going to do just a seminar track with a couple of us. Uh, in 1997, we called it the ESPPW, and we sent out uh, a flyer to every screen printer that we had an SMR softwares list, and we had an amazing response. We had 40 people attend, and we had you know people on the waiting list because we, we cut it off at 40, and <clears throat> we basically just said, hey, Obviously, we have room for a, uh, for a trade show here if we can get this many people just to attend seminars. And the next year, DAX was born, and it went over very, very well. Wait, when And that was first in, in Minneapolis, right? And First then, in Minneapolis. Okay. And then when did you guys expand? What was the next expansion? That was the scary part. In 2001, we moved over to Kansas City, September 7th and 8th, 2001. And I was on the board of directors of SGIA at the time. And when I got home from the show... Something shook the earth, quite literally, 9-1-1, when the terrorists hit the, the towers. And the SGIA show was scheduled to be in like a week and a half. And so I was on the board of directors that had to call off the biggest show in the industry. And that taught me a lot as well about my own show and what we needed to do to prepare for the possibility that something like that could happen to us as well. So Nothing yeah, like that would ever happen again to have to cancel shows, right? No, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I mean, the good news is that, you know, we did learn from that. We did take a good hard look and never expected it to be an entire year's worth of shows, obviously. But we did put plans and safeguards into place to make sure the decks could survive in the event that we had to cancel a show or two. <laughs> or um, <laughs> and hopefully that's it. Yes, exactly. That's true. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. So, OK. It, as, that leads us nicely into this crazy year we're calling 2020 that we, we would probably like to erase from our, our memory banks here. But but I guess, um, you know, obviously you guys as a trade show have been impacted more than anybody else. I, I think that's a pretty safe bet. Us safe and every other show. Yeah, you cor correct. The, the trade show in general, you know, anybody that's doing a live event, that 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 was the first thing to to go. Unfortunately, so I know we've talked to you in, in the past a little bit about this, but you know, things are rolling forward for twenty twenty one right now. They you are. Know, you guys are are accepting uh, applications for booth space we as we speak, right? Yep. So, what 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 does twenty twenty one look like for DAX? 
Well, 2021 for our DAX and for any other trade show is going to be very different than what we're used to. And we are doing our best to adapt to that. Uh, Margie watches the COVID-19 reports from every state in the union and the countries across the world on a daily basis and is keeping us up to date on what's going on there. Uh, there's been a lot of different strategies as far as how people handle things. Uh, I know that our president is being hammered about how he's handled the coronavirus epidemic, but at the same time, and I'm not going to try and defend him because I can't say as I like his personality, <laughs> but the fact is what he did was he allowed the individual localities to deal with this, which, you know, realistically does allow for the individual localities to say, hey, here's what our situation is, not what the nation's situation is, and deem what they needed to do. Currently, Minnesota is in the highest lockdown of any state in the union. Uh, crazy enough, the country of Sweden did nothing about the coronavirus. And while the jury's still out, they might be the ones who come through this the best of anybody because they never locked down their economy. They did not shut down. <clears throat> uh, only foreign trade suffered for them. Their economy's running. Their, their uh, people are able to do what they want. Uh, some are wearing masks, some are not, I understand, but the information there is a little sketchy. And what what really is happening, you know, the media flavors everything, so we really don't know everything, but we catch what we can from the BBC and others. And, you know, who can handle the coronavirus? Well, the coronavirus is the only one that can handle the coronavirus, yeah. you know, and hopefully we'll have a virus soon, but that's not going to be the be all end all. That's not going to just magically snap us out of this and put everything back to normal. Uh, so we are looking at how do shows need to change? And probably for the next two to three years, shows themselves will have to physically change. What we've done, and I'm really looking forward to putting together two floor plans for every show next week as we do first assignment, but we are looking at putting together both a socially distanced floor plan for each show and a traditional floor plan where the booths are next to each other, socially distanced where the booths have, you know, usually probably 10 feet apart so that no company is next to another company. Everybody's basically a corner island. You know, they probably got a, a neighbor behind the curtain, but you know, for the most part, people feel that's safe. But we've looked at the example of, you know, how are grocery stores, big box stores, et cetera, handling the coronavirus? Because that's the closest model that we can find to be able to say, hey, how can we do this safely? And, you know, they're instituting crowd control where basically X number of people can go in at one time. And that's going to be the extent of it. The good news is the venues that we have on uh, have hired can handle uh in our socially distanced floor plan can handle as much capacity as we've ever seen at a show. So we don't have to be able to keep people outside the doors waiting to get in. But people do need to stay six feet away from each other. They'll probably have to wear masks and a number of other changes. We'll have hand sanitizer stations on the floor and we'll just keep on looking at this. And hopefully as each show approaches its final day that, you know, that we can say, hey, we're going or no going probably 21 days out then hopefully we can say, well, okay, here's the floor plan we're able to use. Here we're able to do it or here we're not able to do it. Uh, right now, if we were to do this show in Kansas, in Kansas City, the state of Missouri is open at 50% with no total limitation. So if you've got a venue that can hold 5,000 people, you can have 2,500 people in there if you create your floor plan appropriately. If you'd mandate face masks, if you have hand sanitizer, et cetera, admittedly, Missouri is one of the states you're talking about saying you may not have done it right, you know, and you may be locking down a little bit more. We will see. We've got a contract with the venue so that if it's open enough, if it's as open as it was when we made the contract, which was the 50 percent mask mandate, we will be able to go ahead in Kansas City. Uh, currently, Minnesota, the mandate for meetings is no more than 10 people, period, no matter how big the venue, et cetera. And so, you know, without things changing, Minnesota can't go, but we've got a lot of time there and a lot could change. And hopefully there will be a vaccine, which will loosen a lot of things for us between now and then. Uh, Chicago is our last show. And once again, they have their own set of rules. And uh, the venue there has done some amazing things, including creating a zero pressure environment for the exhibit hall, just like the ICU of a hospital would have, where the air is not recirculated, but it's continually being vented outside. Wow. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. But the trade show industry as a whole is going to have to make major changes. And the largest shows of them all are the ones going to be the hardest hit. Yeah. yeah. Right. There you were know, Scott, I was, I was just thinking when you were talking about uh, people being six feet apart and everything, I just had the sudden thought of, uh, I'm really anxious for the next show to see all these decorators gathering together and see what their face masks look like. Exactly. <laughs> we're going to yeah, see some pretty cool about, like, stuff. Face mask contests. <laughs> yeah, totally. But then oh, you yeah. got to get them together to judge them. So that's the problem. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure out a way. We, we, uh, yeah, we'll figure out a way. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Jerry asks uh, the Kansas City dates for 2021 as of right now. Scott, do you have them handy? Ah, uh, give me uh, a second. I can. Sure, sure. And and while you and while you're looking that up, uh, we actually do have a, a regulator from Sweden, Gusta. It says uh, no mass and, and no mass. So okay, I go. have seen Gusta, who has uh, posted many times before. Kansas City is going to be February nineteenth and twentieth, twenty twenty one. So it is our first show coming up. Uh, assuming the situation in Missouri holds, it will be the first show to open in the industry. Nice, nice. Looking forward. That to That means that Aaron, you and I get to have burnt ends at uh, one of the Kansas City barbecue places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately, one of the things, you know, we are taking a look at, uh, you know, what we can do for hospitality, et cetera, because obviously the party at night where we try to pack as many people into one room as we can, that's <laughs> just not going to be a great idea, it looks like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, well. you know, we'll do what we can for hospitality. We'll keep the exhibitors fed. Uh, we'll do everything that we can and still try to be as safe as possible. All right. All right. Assuming we can have the show go on. Yeah, definitely. Right. So, Scott, if uh, if Minnesota ends up being a minimum or a maximum of ten people, I want to put my name on that list right now. Though, okay. <laughs> well, you know, we I don't know that a lot of exhibitors are going to be willing to go for that because there's going to be more than ten exhibitors in the hall. <laughs> oh man, that, that does mess up things a little bit. It does make it a bit, a bit of a mess, but. Yeah. A whole lot can change, and we're almost five months from Minnesota still. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of, of Minnesota, Scott, how far away is your, your print lab from uh, where the show's held in, in Minnesota there? Well, crazy enough, uh, basically a little over an hour away from the show venue uh, is where we built our new campus that includes our house and the uh, print lab. And my wood shop, which I, you know, yeah, you know, the neat thing huh. is being a screen printer these days, you don't need to be a good woodworker anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> but I do enjoy my woodworking. I build cabinetry, et cetera. Actually, the return you're seeing back here to match my desk is something that I built. Cool. Um, although it's not exactly one of my finest pieces, but it is something that's in the camera view. There you go. There you go. Love it. But yeah, well, we're not that far away. Okay. All right. It's giving me some ideas. So we'll uh, next year we'll we'll talk more about about that. So we'll. we'll oh, it's giving you ideas now. You're scaring me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Be scared. Well, you may have me I, showing up at your house. <laughs> I, I could I could talk all day about all the things that have come and gone in the industry, and it's it's been really fun having you, Scott. Kind of remind me and 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 maybe tell some uh, some younger printers uh, or decorators uh, about what the industry used to be like. But we are well into bonus time. So Scott, how can our listeners find you and the DAX show? www.daxshow, D-A-X, and then show like going to the movies.com. And uh, registration is not yet open for the shows, but will be very soon. Yeah. But if you are an exhibitor or a potential exhibitor, uh, the application process some... is in place. Okay. Wonderful. And then that goes through the end of this month. Is that correct? Uh, for the, the special discount? There is a special discount of $100 off per booth through the end of the month. Uh, there's a $50 discount through the end of December still as well, just like okay. we normally have. Okay. But uh, we'd certainly like to see people get in because the biggest thing is, you know, if you apply right now and get in, as soon as we do first assignment, well, then you have access to being in our exhibitor list that gives you your logo, your web link, and contact information. And that page sees up to 20,000 hits per month, even in slow season. Also, you can be part of our Ad Revolver campaign. Uh, there are people who have been in our Ad Revolver campaign campaign we open it up to the chicago exhibitors who forwarded their booze from last year they've been in there for maybe 21 days some of those people have seen a hundred hits on their ad going to their website as well as you know thousands of views so yeah there's all kinds of opportunities that basically once you put down your deposit on your booth we've got all kinds of stuff to help you start selling right now excellent Awesome. Well, the decorators community will will be there at all three. I need to get that paperwork done this week, actually. So good reminder <laughs> from yourself. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right, Scott. Well, thank you so much for your time and all of the show and tell and uh, looking forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so much. And on behalf of U100, WYOO AM and FM Stereo, I say goodbye. <laughs> oh, <that's awesome. laughs> all right scott we'll see you later oh that was fun that was that was awesome and and man he uh scott brought up a lot of things that i had forgotten about you know in the industry and that's fun fun to talk about but anybody in in in, in the midwest if you have not attended a dax show uh you, you need to do it. it for all of us exhibitors all of us speakers at these events absolutely one of our favorite venues is uh, is to is, are the three dax shows and and uh, strongly encourage you to to check that out
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, I'm going to have to study up, Terry, and uh, see if I can do better next time around because I feel like I got a, a, an F on my uh, test today. <laughs> I, I would have gotten a better night's sleep if I knew there was going to be a quiz. Mm -hmm, so. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Well, Terry, real quick um, on the Reggies, I, I don't think we need to go through all the categories. You guys can go check them out. Uh, but this is the last week to get in your nominations. So, and, uh, you know, we've had in the past where somebody's like, oh, can we nominate so-and-so? You know, I know it's after. And, you know, then we got a thousand emails. And it's like, nope, this is it. We put it out there. It's been out there for several weeks now. So if you want to, the nominations will close at 5 p.m. Uh, Central Time on uh, the 5th of November. And Eric's got the link up on the bottom here. But it's tworegularguys.com slash Reggie's is uh, where you go to uh, put in your nominations. And uh, again, we we're asking you this year to fill in all of the categories. They're, they're all a quote unquote required field. If for whatever reason you just have one, you know, you don't know somebody that's uh, under 40 or, or whatever, and you, you just don't have somebody there, we're going to be okay with a couple of NAs, one or two. But uh, if your, your whole uh, form is uh, Terry comes for this and everything else NA, we're going to have to throw that one out, Terry. I'm sorry, man. All right, so but, I've already uh, thrown yours out, but no, it's kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but November fifth deadline, five p.m. Central. That's uh, that's a firm uh, deadline. And and Matt Vasallo, we're talking to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, good. Uh, Terry, uh, this new exciting thing that's uh, it, it, like a, a retro. It feels retro now, right? <laughs> Appropriate years for this show. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So. Uh, Terry, we've got a five things from you this week. And, Absolutely. Uh, so let's let's hear the intro and then get to five things. All right. Well, Aaron, you know, we are coming up on the end of the year. We're It's the end of October. So uh, I was thinking about year-end reviews. So here are five things to look at in your year-end review. Uh, obviously, number one, obviously sales for the year and in comparison to the previous year, despite COVID. Number two, take a look at your product mix for the year and the profitability of each of those items. Yeah. Number three, look at your marketing for the year and determine what worked and what didn't work. Number four, study the bottlenecks that you encountered and consider how to resolve them for next year. And number five, imagine where you'd like your business to go in the coming year then Aaron, this is for you. Make a plan. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Make a plan. Go over to our success tracker at our success group. We'll help you get there. How about that? Very good. Very <laughs> little, good. little shameless plug for me there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you didn't even know that was happening. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anything that we can announce, Terry, you said you're working on some things, but uh, is it is it here? Uh, I, I don't have dates to announce yet. Okay. Uh, right. I, I am going to be, though, next uh, Thursday, uh, and you can do this through the Equipment Zone website, we're going to be talking about holiday marketing ideas for sublimation printing. That'll be next Thursday at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern time, uh, which means noon, uh, Central Time, Center of the Universe. Yes, exactly. It's, it's all you need, just the central time there. All right. So uh, so some things coming up, though, still? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I, have, I have several things in the work. I just, uh, I'm just not ready to announce quite yet. Terry, it's just you and I. You can tell us. It's okay. Okay. So uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you whisper it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so Eric, uh, coming up today, uh, as usual, it's Education Friday. I think we've uh, determined. And uh, Eric's got the take up happening at uh, 2.30 Mountain Time. That's 3.30 Central Time for everybody else. Um, <laughs> so today it's all about digitizing and embroidery for durability. Uh, so really good stuff uh, from Eric over there. Uh, even if you're not an embroiderer, I think just you, you're going to learn a lot and, and understand a lot. So it's well worth catching over there. You catch him at facebook.com slash eric.campbell, and that's E-R-I-C-H dot Campbell. Or you can find him at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, F-B with the E, or with FB with E. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> he even spelled it out and I screwed it up. So anyway, you can catch him over there. Or you can also find him on his YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash C says Eric Campbell, E-R-I-C-H Campbell. Uh, and then 
another thing that I want to make sure, and, and we've talked about this before, but I think it's worth continuing to mention here because as Scott was showing some of those examples today, especially that jacket, um, he, he was talking about some techniques and things. And as you guys know, I know very little about embroidery, <laughs> but I know about that because I watched Eric's Demystify Next Level Digitizing webinar, and uh, it is recorded and available for you to check out. It talks about better running, bolder, more beautiful embroidery with faster cycle time from concept to completion. Uh, you know, the thing Scott was talking about how you could just by changing the way the things are stitched, you get some dimension to your product. And, and he was showing some side-by-side -side examples that uh, uh, just I thought were amazing. So uh, definitely worth checking that out. You can check out his webinar at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Eric D-D, E-R-I-C-H-D-D. And um, one more quick shout out for Eric. Uh, the reciprocators are, uh, you know, so we have the regulators. Eric has the reciprocators. So I think sometime we might end up having this like Anchorman style clash, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I, I, I hope not. I hope not because you do. Eric's a me. very big man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be on the reciprocator side if that's the case. <laughs> all right. Uh, so check out all that stuff from Eric and make sure you to tune in this afternoon and, and get that uh, webinar from Eric as well. All right. <laughs> Eric says that escalated quickly. I, I know. I apologize. <laughs> uh, Terry, for me, uh, tomorrow, Small Business Saturday is happening at 1230 Central Time. And uh, it, this is the second week of my 10-week program that we're doing on going through the success principles, the uh, Jack Canfield uh, series. The Jack Canfield is co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, has a book called The Success Principles. And uh, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about knowing what you want. Last week, we talked about our life purpose and, and figuring out what our purpose in life is. And, and so now the next evolution of that is, okay, now that we know what we're all about, how do we decide what we want from our business, our life, et cetera? And uh, so we're going to go through that. And that is happening over at liveosg.com. That'll get you to our YouTube channel. Or you can check it out at facebook.com slash our success group pro. So uh, check all that out happening. Good stuff coming up. And uh, looking forward to talking to everybody tomorrow on that. But Terry, well into bonus time. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, I lost it up there somewhere else, but Gusta said, you know, great history show. And, um, and then Todd did mention that Terry killed a man with a trident. So, <laughs> uh, all right. I just can't help anchorman references. It's one of my favorite all time movies. So, um, <laughs> sorry, Terry, but that's awesome. <laughs> I'm just in my mind. I'm seeing that fight scene. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, all right. So Terry, we have come to the close of another show. Thank you so much to Scott Ritter for joining us again. Make sure to go check them out over at Dax show. There's no S at the end of that D a X S H O W.com. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys live and in person at the Dax shows there in 2021. And can't wait to uh, get together with Scott. Absolutely. And you'll get to see all of us, including our show producer, Eric Campbell. And uh, we want to thank Eric for all the work he does as the producer. You can find him at ericcampbell.com. Indeed. Next week, Terry, we've got another great show in the works for you. Michelle Moxley, who is the Director of Innovation for m &R Equipment. Uh, she is going to be coming on to talk to us about hybrid printing digital evolution. So this is going to be some groundbreaking stuff. We're going to ask her to... Uh, Tell us some secrets, you know, just amongst friends, like we try to try to always do. <laughs> but uh, no, we're really looking forward to talking to Michelle. Uh, she is uh, really somebody special in our industry, and, and the fact that uh, she's going to take some time to uh, spend with us, Terry, I'm I'm pretty excited about that. You know, M Michelle helped me out with a photo for an article about a month ago, so it'll be nice to meet her in person, face to face here on uh, on uh, on the show. But Aaron, until then, I'm Terry Combs. He's Aaron Montgomery. And we are the Two Regular Guys. Thank you for listening to Two Regular Guys. Check out our website at tworegularguys.com. That's the number two, regularguys.com. You can also interact with us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash tworegularguys, or send us a tweet, twitter.com slash tworegularguys. And we have a YouTube page. You can find all that from our website, tworegularguys.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to spending some time with you again next week.